This was my guest in the early 70s. And here he is today, internationally known heart surgeon, Dr. Dudley Johnson. He is my special guest next on I Remember Milwaukee. I Remember Milwaukee is brought to you in part by Elsa's on the Park, named in honor of Elsa Kopp, a German immigrant who started her own business in 1950. Elsa's on the Park has been serving Milwaukee since 1980. Hi, I'm Jim Peck. Welcome to I Remember Milwaukee. Joining me tonight is Dr. Dudley Johnson. Milwaukee has become an international center for heart surgery, and it was here in the 1960s that Dr. Johnson helped to blaze the trail using new techniques in cardiac surgery. Take a look. Many people call him Dr. Hope, but that is somewhat misleading. Dr. Dudley Johnson has given much more than just hope to literally thousands of heart patients. He has extended and improved their lives. This native of Wisconsin is the man who pioneered the coronary bypass procedure by removing a vein from a patient's leg and implanting it into a blocked coronary artery. He performed the world's first double bypass surgery and he was part of the surgical team that successfully transplanted a healthy heart into Betty Annick of West Allis. These days, Dr. Johnson is emphasizing preventative medicine and early intervention as ways to reduce the need for his services. What a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for, for about 30 years. Uh, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> bypass surgery is so common now. People say, oh, gee, my dad went in for bypass surgery. Oh, how's he always oh, doing fine? But there was a time when nobody knew anything about bypass surgery. You did the first one. How did it occur to you? I don't know how it occurred to me. Uh, my chief at the time, Dr. Lepley, gave me a totally free hand to do anything that I wanted and was very supportive. So I went around to see what was going on around the country. And there were a few other centers trying to do procedures for coronary disease. And one of them, of course, was the Cleveland Clinic where Dr. Soans initiated or invented the catheterization study to take pictures of coronary arteries. So that was a huge help, of course before anything specific could be done. And they were using a vein as a patch on a coronary. And I came home and I did a couple of patches and it seemed to me this wasn't very satisfactory, or extremely limited in where it could be done. And we quickly worked out a way that we could take the vein and cut the end of it obliquely like a patch, sew it to a coronary far down beyond all of the disease and simply hook the other end up to the aorta. We also worked out a way to preserve the heart and stop it because we can't sew these into a tenth of an inch vessel when it's beating and moving and blood squirting out. So equally important to the technique was the development of a method to protect the heart muscle to allow this to be done. And the system, there had been two or three others who had tried using a vein in a coronary and one or two successes but not with this technique and the others were all limited to one coronary and with this technique we were able to do this to all of the primary and secondary coronary branches. Now, before we get too far ahead, because I know you also did the multiple bypass, and that, and that of course, had never been done before either. But uh, you said Dr. Lepley gave you a free hand, but at the same time, you're, you come back now and you say, gee, I've got this idea. It's never been done before successfully, but I think I'd like to try it on a patient. As a physician, what problems do you run into when you come back to your institution and say, I want to try something brand new? You mean now or then? Then. Then if I wanted it, I just called the operating room and I told the girls up there that I knew I was going to do this procedure and we put it on the schedule and did it. Now, since you asked me now or then, I assume it's a little bit different now. Well, we've been trying to get a new operation going now for at least three years and it's a phenomenal political event to get it through the hospital committees, to get it through the FDA, all that sort of thing. It's an enormous struggle to develop and start a new operation. So it was actually easier back then? Enormously easier. Did you have any doubts that this would work when you did that first bypass? Not really, no. Did anyone else? 
Uh, well, I guess there always were and still are skeptical people about new things that are different. But but nothing that really got in your way. Nobody said, "Are, are you know, Dudley? Are you out of your mind? You can't uh, you can't do this." Um, not that I remember. If they did, I ignored it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about the technique of preserving the heart. Talk a little bit about that because again, that it hadn't been done. Well, back then we would cool, I'd put patients on heart-lung machine for doing valve surgery or congenital surgery. And one of the ways of protecting it would be to cool the patient's way down. Then when they're on heart-lung bypass, the aorta is cross-clamped to stop all blood flow into the heart. And the heart quiets down and arrests. And if it's very cold, you can sit there for a longer time and do work without any circulation going through the heart. But people in those days had a feeling that these patients already have bad coronary disease. With a, that means there's an obstruction to the blood flow to the heart muscle. And we must preserve flow all the time in these coronaries or they're going to be a big problem. Well, that's not true. Uh, and this is what made it possible because we stopped the heart. And once the patient is on heart-lung bypass, for example, the heart's not doing much of any work. And if there was enough blood supply in those coronaries to keep the heart muscle going when the patient is up and around, even though it's deficient, they were still living. Once the patient is on heart-lung bypass, it seemed reasonable that the heart should not require anywhere near as much blood or oxygen because the heart's not working hard. And we did a few studies in the laboratory and demonstrated this is true, that the, the animal or person on the heart-lung machine, the heart does not consume anywhere near as much oxygen. Therefore, the heart with coronary disease should tolerate the cross-clamping of the aorta just as well as the heart does it has valve disease. And this proved to be very true. So we were able to cross-clamp the aorta for short periods of time, do some work on the coronaries, release it, let the heart perfuse, and, and it worked out very well. So clumsily, been, clumsily, I would say it's almost like an, a tourniquet. On the aorta, sure, we yeah. cross-clamp it. So there's no backflow going into the, the coronary arteries at all. And when one does this, the heart very quickly calms down and becomes very quiet. So, and we open up a coronary, there's very little, if any, blood that comes out of it. And we're able to sew our bypass to these small coronaries. Mm. Was that first bypass successful? Yes. How did you select that patient? Now, you've got a number of patients with, with cardiac problems. You're going to try a new procedure. What sort of person were you looking for? Well, initially we started out and just did the single, simple, single bypass, the first patient, the first few patients. And it worked very well to the right coronary. Well, they had a localized obstruction and the artery down below was normal. And most patients with coronary disease, the obstructions are localized. It does not involve the whole coronary. Now, in a few people it does, and we've worked out techniques later years to handle that. So it's just a bypass going around a localized obstruction, hooking up the vein to the side of the coronary. And the unique part about hooking the vein into the side of the coronary is that it allows flow to go both directions in that coronary. Down below the obstruction, it backfills as well as forward flows. So it'll take care of that whole coronary below the proximal obstruction. And we just looked for a patient, and we found one. And the first bypass actually was done out at the county hospital in those days. <clears throat> did you guys have a party afterward? Did you, did you, I mean, I can see people high-fiving and saying, by golly, we did it. This has never been done before. It must have been a great feeling. It was a fine feeling, but I suspect more likely we sat with a patient all night to make sure she did okay. <laughs> <laughs> that relieves me a lot to hear okay. you say that. Okay. Um, you later did something that was even more spectacular, and that was a heart transplant probably the most dramatic thing I think I can still think of in medicine. We haven't figured out how to do a brain transplant yet, although I'm certainly hoping that it'll happen soon. Um, why did you do that? Uh, again, was there, was there any resistance? Were you able to just call up and say, gee, I think I'm going to transplant a heart tomorrow? Well, back in 68, the Bernard, shortly before, did the first transplant. Christian Barnegan. And of course, it was a huge macho image to be able to do a transplant, and many surgeons still think it's a huge macho image to do transplants. And obviously there are patients who enormously benefit from the transplant. And results now are spectacularly better than what they were 30 years ago in terms of longevity afterwards because there's so much more known about how to control the immune problems. Uh, everybody was trying to do them and there was a whole rash of transplants all over the country. 
not uh, very many of them successful. Very few were success. And for a while, Betty Annick was the longest survival in the country, in now the world. Do you know, Betty Annick, because there are a lot of people who weren't alive right. when... She was the first patient we did the transplant on. And she was, uh, which I think lived for about 15 years, if I remember. No, I think it was about eight years, is my recollection. Well, it's close. To, it's, but no, but that was a fabulous thing. I remember talking to Mrs. Annick, and uh, it was, it was... I think it was about five years in at that point, and she said, "Jim, this is this is five years that I that I would not have been alive if it hadn't been for this." It was certainly a spectacular boon to the whole concept of heart surgery for the public, and made heart surgery incredibly acceptable. And for reasons I never quite understood, to be able to do heart surgery now seems to be a big macho thing for a hospital. Not only hospitals; I've recently been in other countries around the world, in very poor countries. And somehow they all want, the governments want to be able to do heart surgery as some kind of a macho image that seem, seemingly makes their country or their government look better if we can do heart surgery in our country. Now, are you saying that you did so, it kind of because it was a macho thing? And you just sort of no, wanted no, we to... just did it. And I don't understand why I didn't in any way think of it as a macho thing. It was just something to... Why try. was Betty Annick's transplant so successful. She lived much longer at that time than anybody else had. Uh, just to keep people alive for six months was, ex was well, tremendous then. The surgery went fine and the surgery for transplant is relatively easy surgery. Really? And I can't answer why. We didn't do anything different than anybody else. She just fortunately had the right donor heart and immune system that tolerated it for a long time. Where did you find that heart, by the way? I, I, now we think of uh, organ uh, donations. I mean, something you check off on your, on your license, uh, driver's license. But it, at that time, I don't think it was anywhere near that common. Uh, my recollection is the donor was, uh, I believe it was some criminal or potentially criminal injury to the person, to the brain. And there was some controversy then. And People were reluctant to use that as a donor, but the family of the donor agreed and everything, so. How do you measure success in what you do? Is it just a question of somebody staying alive? I well, shouldn't say that just a measure. That seems to be a great measure. I think there's several levels of success. One obviously looks at the immediate mortality of surgery. And unfortunately, like in bypass surgery, the government and other things tend to look only overall mortality in bypass surgery. There are many risk factors in patients which significantly increase the risk of an operation. It's obvious to everybody the risk of heart surgery in an 80-year-old is higher than in a 50-year-old. Uh, somebody who's had a lot of heart attacks and there's been extensive damage and they have a great big sick heart, the risk of surgery is much higher than in somebody who has not had heart muscle injury. Diabetes adds to the risk and a number of these features which tremendously changed the risk. And one should have an idea before surgery of the anticipated risk for this set of circumstances. And some patients are under 1% risk. We operate on patients at least 50% risk. And to, for the government or somebody to go out and blindly say, X surgeon has so much mortality really is meaningless unless documentation of the selectivity of patients is presented. And we do a lot of high-risk patients, but when somebody comes in on a respirator and a mechanical pump working a balloon pump and they're, they're literally dying, the patient and the family really don't care whether it's 50% risk or 80%. Somebody's going to try because otherwise they're gone, and we get a significant number of that type of patient. You didn't continue now, with the transplant uh, particularly. Why was that? Well, one of the reasons we had started bypass surgery shortly before, and the hospitals were just jammed with patients for bypass. The waiting list for coronary surgery was commonly two months. And these sick patients, many of them literally stayed in the hospital for weeks waiting to have their surgery done. Uh, transplant patients in those days took up so much time in the hospital, uh, prolonged days and weeks, and so much effort of personnel. Uh, we felt we could handle more people and make a bigger contribution working in the coronary field than trying to fill up with transplant patients. About how many bypasses have you done? Patients, personally, oh, probably around 8,500, somewhere in that range. Wow. 8,500 of these? When I think of the amount of people, because that's 8,500 individuals that you've operated on, but then they have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers mm -hmm. and children, the impact is, is incredible. Yeah, we've done husband and wives and
parents and children over the years. <laughs> you talked a little bit about um, about the changes that have that have occurred over the years. And I can see you smiling as I as I'm saying this. Uh, you said that uh, it, back in '68, you said uh, let's do this, and you went ahead and did it. Now there are all kinds of red tape. How does that impinge upon you as a physician? Well, I tend to get involved in new procedures and doing new things, and it can be very frustrating to try to get clearance to do some of these things. And this was never a problem in the past. So it's a dramatic change in medicine. Uh, insurance carriers, et cetera, they're not going to pay for anything different. HMOs, uh, it's been a huge hindrance in trying to do high-risk patients. Uh, we, for all of our life, have had patients referred from around the country who, by and large, have been refused elsewhere. And increasingly, local HMOs, if our surgeons won't do it, we're not going to pay to go anywhere else. So they don't even give the patients an option of some type of procedure. Mm. And the same applies to a lot of these insurance companies locally. If it's not straightforward down the line, they're not going to support it or pay for it. You are also very well known, uh, as I understand it, uh, doing research for the show, in the kind of follow-up you do on your surgeries that, is, that is, is really kind of an uncommon follow-up. Talk a little bit about that, if you would, please. Well, almost from the beginning, it became obvious to me this operation was going to take off and be widely successful because there were so many people around with chest pain and coronary disease. And it also seemed apparent that sooner or later, governments and insurance companies are going to question this massive use of funds for this surgery. And it was essential that we follow our patients. And we have. And over the years, we maintained uh, close to 99% 90, follow-up on every patient we've operated. This was really a little mini science in itself, which evolved to be able to do this. But we've studied and followed 5, 10, 15-year life tables, survivals in different groups, relief of angina over the years. And talking about how to measure results, I mentioned immediate operative mortality. But we also like to talk about, for example, if a patient has bypass surgery, we don't care the disease, it can progress. We're not changing someone's chemistry. And what is the chances of needing another operation within five years? Well, in our incidents, it's, in our case, it's one and a half percent in five years, which is lower than most any other that I've seen. But patients don't know enough to ever ask their surgeons, what's your reoperation rate in five years? Uh, what percentage of patients are totally free of their heart symptoms one year later, not next week, but a year later? Uh, and in our data, it's around 78% of men, 82% of women, completely free of heart symptoms Ooh. a year later. And those are the kind of things that we like to analyze in terms of results. HMOs are only concerned of how many days you're in the hospital and get you out. They don't really have any concern about five-year results. But don't they see that, and I, I, I realize I'm, I'm kind of setting you up with this, with this question because I have a rough idea what your answer is going to be, but don't they understand that if you do this kind of follow-up, if you do take this care, they're not going to have to pay for another one in five years. Well, one large HMO told us recently when we talked to them about doing some of their patients, and I told them our five-year data. I said, we have no concern about five-year data. The turnover of our patients is two years. They go on to another HMO. If you're, you can do whatever you want, or more graphs than the average of others, and take more. but if your patients are in the hospital one day longer than the others, you're out. And those are the people who are going to be making health care decisions for us. Right, right. So there's a happy thought, uh, uh, friends. The, uh, what, now, what, you're working on a new pro, uh, procedure right now. Well, really, the world doesn't understand what AF is. That's atrial fibrillation. Well, it's, you're talking to somebody right. who's part of that world. Yeah, so okay. what is it? Well, atrial fibrillation is the single most common rhythm problem in society. It's a, the normal heart rhythm begins with an electrical impulse in the atrium, or the upper chamber of the heart. The eight, right and left atrium contract, push the blood to the ventricles, and then the ventricles contract. In atrial fibrillation, that rhythm mechanism is lost. Uh, there are many, the atrial muscles are just quivering, their impulse is coming from all over, uh, so it's a totally non-coherent contraction. Each muscle is functioning independently. As a result, all the atrial muscle just quivers and the blood passively goes through the atrium into the ventricle. The rhythm which gets through to the ventricle with all these wild impulses is very chaotic. The pulse is completely irregular, not like in every third or fourth beat, but all the way through it's completely chaotic and irregular. 
and oftentimes the ventricular response is 150 or more rates. So the patients feel very weak and tired. They feel this palpitation, pulses. At any rate, this rhythm problem escalates dramatically in frequency with age. It's relatively uncommon under 60, although there's the rare congenital form. But in 80-year-olds, it may be 15% of the people. But there's, I guess, at least 2 million in the country with this problem. And we were taught for years it's the benign unpleasant rhythm problem. Absolutely wrong. There have been big studies now. Uh, you don't drop dead like you do with the ventricle fibrillates, but there's millions of these people. Their stroke rate goes up five times higher than comparable population. It's the cause of about 25% of all strokes in our country and the leading cause of hospital days, which is an amazing, of various diseases because of all the strokes and disability. And why do they get strokes? Every heart in the left atrium of the left upper chamber has a blind pouch called the atrial appendage. And when all this muscle is, well, when the heart's beating, the appendage beats along with it and the blood moves in and out. But when the atrium is fibrillating, that appendage is quivering with the rest of the heart. It's a blind pouch. Blood sits there. It's not passively moving anywhere and blood tends to clot. So clots form in there. They can progress, break off, and cause all these embolic episodes and strokes. So it's a dramatic uh, debilitating disease. And I personally consider the left atrial appendage the most lethal human attachment. Mm. Now, can you show me where that is on here? This is looking front of the heart, the pulmonary artery coming to the lungs. And this is a little front. But this is really where the appendage is, behind the pulmonary artery. And you can see a blind, blind pouch. Mm -hmm. It literally sits there like that. And what we plan to do with surgery is to go in through a thoroscope, elevate this, and just staple it off and remove it. There is no known function of that appendage. Hmm. And we've routinely been removing this for several years whenever we operate on a patient, even if they're not in fibrillation. It takes two or three minutes once we're in the chest and get rid of it. So if this person gets old enough and goes into atrial fibrillation in the future, he doesn't have to worry about a stroke. Hmm. Um, what brought you to Milwaukee? Uh, well, I sort of came back home. I grew up in Madison, then I went off into service, and I was exposed to Dr. Ellison when I was in service in Ohio, and Dr. Ellison then during that time came up here to be chief of surgery. And down there, I had heard he was such a great teacher, so that was a big stimulus to come back here for surgical training. And you could have gone anywhere. You were you are internationally famous. Well, I was, a, I was a nobody in those days. No, but you, you stopped being a nobody a long, long time ago. Okay. Is this a good place to stay for a, for a physician? Why did you stay here? There's more press other places. There may be more bigger hospitals. Well, I've looked around at various places over the years to go and practice. Every place has its frustration and its politics, and the politics is a little different everywhere. Even in other countries, every place in medicine is loaded with politics. So there isn't an ideal place to practice. Um, you spend time all over the all over the world. I know you've been in Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you doing down there? I think you met uh, Castro, didn't you? Yes, I was first there about ten years ago, and we worked down there for two weeks. I believe I was the first American surgeon down there to teach and lecture and demonstrate coronary surgery. They had a, a fairly active heart surgical program, so it wasn't going in blind. They had some background, and I followed through. And we've been back twice. We were there this summer again to work for a week. And, show them a few things. When we were down there, the first time we spent an evening with Castro. What's he like? Uh, well, just like, is he never shuts up, he talks a lot. <laughs> really? And, but I knew that to anticipate that. But he has a phenomenal memory for all kinds of details and was devoted to medicine. For example, he knew the percentage of newborns that would have congenital heart disease out of a thousand and built facilities to handle that sort of thing, which is unusual for a person in that position. But. It was frustrating then and now because of our blockade, which I totally don't understand. As a physician, uh, it's a flagrant violation of human rights to actively interfere in the dissemination of medical information. And, and we do that? Uh, our country doesn't allow anything to go down there. Not only supplies or equipment, but no magazines. And I don't know how many hundreds of different forms of medical journals there are and books of all the different specialties and nurses and technicians. None of that is allowed down there. To me, this is a gross violation of human rights. Regardless of your politics, I mean, you, of one's politics, I mean, you're personally, but I mean, it's, it's got to be a 
just an awful thing to, to try to stop people from knowing enough to help themselves. Right. Well, between then and now, it hasn't changed from that point of view. Mm. Um, a personal question. And we were just before we went on the air, uh, we were talking a little bit about your family, and you have a daughter who's involved in acupuncture. Now, what did Dad, the uh, the, the physician, think about daughter going into acupuncture? <laughs> it's totally her prerogative to do what she wants, and she went at it with a lot of enthusiasm and is working in that field. Would you have her do it to you? Uh, under, I would consider it under certain, if I needed certain types of procedures, yes. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much. This was a pleasure. All too short a half hour. Thank you for being with us. Hope we'll see you next time on I Remember Milwaukee. I Remember Milwaukee is brought to you in part by Cops Frozen Custard Stands, where a portion of the Thursday's child flavor of the day receipts is donated to the health care needs of the world's most disadvantaged youth. Cops has served Milwaukee area neighborhoods since 1950. Experts look for World War II relics, art glass, and movie memorabilia as Antiques Roadshow concludes its visit to Los Angeles. Next at 7, right here on Channel 10.